What's the craziest thing you've ever witnessed in real life with your own two eyes? Story 1. I witnessed a guy on a sports bike approach an intersection with a red light. As he got close, the light turned green and he gunned it through the intersection, probably peaking at about 50 miles per hour in a 30 per mile hour zone. Only problem was a truck decided to run the red light and the biker T-boned the truck right in front of the rear axle. The bike stopped immediately and the rider went airborne. He traveled about 20 to 30 feet in the air before hitting the ground and tumbling another 15 to 20 feet. The only piece of gear he was wearing was a helmet, but it didn't save him. When he hit the truck, his helmet was ejected from his head and he landed head first from his flight. According to the paramedics, the rider perished on impact with the ground. It was a very gruesome sight, and because of it, I always check for cross-traffic when approaching a light like the biker did. Hitting an intersection at a high speed just as your light turns green is not a smart idea. But the guy in the truck should not have run the light either. The worst part was that I saw the whole thing coming, from the biker coming up from behind me to the guy running the light, and there was nothing I could do to warn the guy on the bike. An excessive amount of people in my town whine about how the city is moving to roundabouts at appropriate intersections, namely at highway underpasses. In addition to 30% more efficiency in moving traffic, they reduce fatal accidents by 90%. Love it. A friend of mine rode motorcycles for a long time. He was very careful. He always told me he got on this thing knowing that he could get in an accident at any time, and he took every precaution when he drove. He still got in an accident. It wasn't even his fault. He was cut off by a car that sped off and they never found it. He spent some time in the hospital with a broken leg, but uh, otherwise he emerged luckily intact. Story 2. One of my friends pulled himself up on top of what looked like a raised concrete platform. Turned out to be a vat of cow poop with a crusted layer on top. He got on top of the outside wall, took one step, and fell through and nearly drowned in liquid cow poop, vomited everywhere, jumped into a nearby river fully clothed to get it off. Details, please. This is amazing. You know, I'm fine with less details this time around. I think I've got all the pertinent story points, thank you very much. Was there no smell on this thing at all? On a giant wall of poop? And was this farm generating so much poop that this is their solution for storing it? Story 3. I have a couple. 1. Downtown Vancouver. In line for a bar at about 11.30 p.m. Homeless guy walks by me about 20 feet, drops his pants, and takes the wettest dump I've ever seen right on the sidewalk. 2. High school. Hanging out with a friend in his bedroom. He gets into a fight with his dad. Dad barges into the room and my friend simultaneously shuts the door on his finger. Finger came off. Now that I think about it, I live a pretty sheltered life. Thanks, Western civilization. Well, you know the question we gotta ask here, right? Which finger? Because you could pretty much go down the line and make a joke for every finger. I mean, middle finger, obviously, that's gonna be the funny one. The index finger, that'll teach you to point... Uh, you know, you could just go on, but man, were they able to reattach the finger? I'm pretty sure the dad never let the kid live that one down. That kid is never going to have a door in his room for the rest of his life. Story 4. My weirdest experience was in Indianapolis. I was sitting at a light in a convertible, and a truck driver pulls up and shouts, Hey! Y'all want some mayonnaise? And then picks up a huge 64-ounce plus container of mayo and throws it at me. Thankfully, I caught it. Could have gone horribly awry, though. Still to this day, I don't know why this happened. Edit. Recurring question. Not only did I eat the mayo, I was on my way to a cookout, so a lot of people ate it. Refreshingly funny slash ridiculous in the midst of this horrific thread. Story 5. I was on vacation with my family in San Francisco. Two homeless men got into a shouting match. One yelled, Chew on this, fricky! rushed a flock of pigeons, grabbed one in his hands, and hurled it at the other homeless man. The other man caught the pigeon in one hand, he had a trumpet in the other, and yelled back, Respect all God's creatures! and tossed it into the air. The pigeon flew away, and the man resumed playing his trumpet. 
Chew on this fricky has to be the greatest statement of all time. Story 6. I was in New York City for a meeting with a co-worker in June of this past year. Since it was an amazing day out, we decided to have our meeting out in one of the local parks since it was an informal meeting and both of us wanted to enjoy the weather. After spending the morning going through our business, we both decided on lunch. Before we left, I needed to find a restroom. There was a public restroom in this park. It was well-maintained and clean, but really busy. Since all the urinals were taken up, I stepped into a stall and did my business. As I'm leaving the stall, I'm careful to not swing the door open quickly since there were quite a few people in the restroom. Since I'm stepping out slowly, I happen to notice a guy walk in wearing an apron for one of the local coffee places nearby. He walks up to a single urinal, not a trough, a single urinal that's already occupied by someone, squeezes in next to the guy, and ends up peeing on the other guy's hands. It happened so quickly that the original urinator had no idea what was happening. He backed away from the urinal, staring at his hand, screaming, What the frick? What the frick? The guy with the coffee apron never stopped peeing and just said over and over, Sorry, man. The guy who got peed on threw a punch in the crowded bathroom, and the coffee apron guy still never stopped peeing. I decided I did not want to be in that bathroom any longer and quickly snuck out. The coffee apron guy should have gotten a buddy to flank the dude's other side and box him in, then start a casual conversation as if he wasn't there. Okay, we talk about the person wearing the coffee store apron. It almost makes it sound like that's all he's wearing. Was he homeless? What was he dressed like otherwise? Was this guy dressed like he was on a break from work? Or like he just stole it from the coffee company. It sounds like the person in the story really wants to give blame to the coffee place for treating its employees bad or not letting them use the restroom for breaks or something. I'm just trying to get the full picture here. Story 7. Driving through Cleveland, I saw a naked, fat, homeless man rolling around on the sidewalk as some super skinny woman with just pants and a do-rag, no shirt or bra, was screaming at him and kicking him as he rolled down the street. That was the mayor, for your information. Story 8. I was riding with my sister, and she glanced at the rearview mirror and said, Oh my God! I glanced back and saw a truck flipping end over end. Not rolling sideways. Flipping end over end. My brother-in-law and I ran back to help, leaving my sister and nephew a ways off because we knew it was going to be gruesome. The driver, a teenage girl, crawled out and stood up without a scratch. Apparently, she pulled into the other lane to pass, but there were cars coming before she could make it back in, so she swerved off onto the shoulder and started flipping. Story 9. When I was 18, I watched my father perish on a random driveway as I gave him CPR. He had a heart attack while on a walk with my mother, and she ran inside a house and called 911 and me. I was an EMT, off-duty at home at the time, and showed up at the same time as emergency services. When I got on scene, I started doing chest compressions as a firefighter used an ambubag on him for air. I clearly remember every second of the incident, and I can and have written it out many times in an effort to deal with it and get it out of my head. I used to have horrible nightmares, and I couldn't get the thought of my father's vomit-covered, unalive face out of my mind for a good two years. After a few minutes of CPR, a defibrillator showed up, and they shocked my dad once. He regained his sinus rhythm for a moment, and then flatlined again. We put him in an ambulance and sent him to the hospital. He was declared DOA. I remember my mother softly holding back tears and asking if everything was going to be okay. I was 18 and didn't know what to say, so I said, Nobody is gone until a doctor says they're gone. She told me to go home and call our family to let them know what happened. When I got home, I cried my eyes out and then got ready to call my dad's mom, sister, and brother, my brother's sister, and my mom's mother. Before I could muster the strength to call, my mother called from the hospital to say the doctors had declared him gone. I then had to tell my grandmother that her son was gone, and his brother and sister, their brother was gone. I had to tell my siblings that our father was gone. It was messed up. I hate thinking about it, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I feel a little numb writing it out here. 
It brings back crazy flashes of images I don't ever want in my head again. Did this person continue being an EMT? He couldn't have been an EMT long. It's so tragic that one of the first things he had to do early in his career was go to his dad and then not being able to save him. I wouldn't blame him if he decided to choose another career after that. It could be really disillusioning. Story 10. Me and two friends decided to go to the local 24-hour grocery store. Friend A happened to have the gorilla suit used for messing with other people in public in his trunk. Friend B decided that we will buy our freaking pizzas dressed as a gorilla. He dons the suit and we go into the store. It is 3 a.m. The store is mostly empty and we laugh at several employees giving us odd looks. Or we chuckle at the spectacle. As we walk by one aisle, I look over and see a giant yellow chicken staring back. Two different groups of people, without any planning beforehand, manage to dress up as animals, go to the same store at the same hour, 3 a.m. Gorilla and chicken stare at each other intensely and prepare to fight. But everybody was too busy thinking, holy frickin' what the frick? The employees all presumably assumed we had gathered together before entering the store, but to this day, I can't help but imagine the laws of ludicrousness at that moment to be the most important night of our lives. Unfortunately, we got scared and ran from the store with our frozen pizzas in tow, trying to forget the unbelievable coincidence that we had just witnessed. Pizza wasn't that great either. Animal gang war. Holy hell. Story 11. I've seen numerous accidents, knife fights, you name it, but Mother Nature kicked all their butts this year. We were down in Baja at a beach called Los Cerritos. I was in knee-deep water with my daughter when someone yelled, Whale! Usually, this means someone spotted a spout or something, so I'm thinking, no big deal. Well, a second or two later, someone else yelled, so I looked up, and there they were. A huge gathering of humpback whales, breaching, dancing, tail wagging. I've seen this before, but never in these numbers. Then, instead of watching this show slowly swim away, they stayed. Those whales stayed in that same spot and played for well over 20 minutes. It was the most incredible thing I've ever witnessed, and I've been around. Story 12. When I was about 13, we had a ritual during the summer where we would hang out at my buddy's house and alternate between hanging on his front porch and playing Super Mario in his second floor bedroom. One day we were doing the same old on the porch and decided to go in and fire up the Nintendo. Good decision. After about 10 minutes, we heard a tremendous crash from the four-corner stop out front and the whole house shook. Being closest to the window, I looked out and saw a huge old Monte Carlo flying through the air into his yard. I yelled, Accident! and was the first to run down to see what was going on. I got to the front door and opened it to be greeted by a Ford Escort on the porch, crunched up like an accordion, with a middle-aged man inside covered in blood with his hand extended toward me, moaning in agony. It was awful. We spent the next four hours trying to stop the bleeding with bedsheets and watched as paramedics tried in vain to get him out with the jaws of life until they finally lost him. I can still picture his face to this day. Poor guy. Edit. Grammar. Wow. I'm sorry you had to go through something like that. It's a good thing that they decided to go play games when they did. Thankfully, they were away from the accident and they were safe from any fallout. Did any of the neighbors notice this as well? Did they call 911 or did someone else do it? I thought being 18 and an EMT trying to save somebody's life was harsh, but being 13 and trying to use bed sheets to stop bleeding, that is just brutal. Story 13. I live in Philadelphia and I was walking up Broad Street, one of the main thoroughfares in the city. All of a sudden, I hear sirens, which isn't that unusual, and I see a cop racing down the street, which also isn't that unusual, but then I see a jeep oblivious to this cop, start to cross broad. At about this time, I got the, oh frick, this is going to end horrendously face, and stopped to watch. Well, the jeep gets about halfway across the street when the cop, who is doing at least 65 to 70, broadsides the jeep, goes airborne, and flips end over end twice, and then lands upside down. 
While the cop is flipping over, the jeep is doing a barrel roll, also airborne, but underneath the cop. And this is where it reaches the point of frick-to-death insanity. After the cop lands, the jeep freaking lands on top of the cop. And it's like one giant pile of twisted metal, broken glass, and shredded rubber. A few seconds later, all of the other cops who were racing to the same crime scene as the first come barreling down broad. They all screech to a halt, jump out of their cars with their guns drawn as if the driver of the Jeep was some mastermind terrorist bent on murdering the Philadelphia police force. I like to imagine that when you say cop, you don't mean cop car, but an actual police officer. I was picturing some sort of human man running at 70 miles per hour and T-boning a Jeep with the force of a train. Story 14. A few years ago, I was in Boston visiting some friends and went outside to smoke a cigarette. I'm standing on the sidewalk, enjoying the autumn chill, and two cars screech to a halt in front of me. Neither moved for a minute, so I didn't think anything of it. Just odd. Then, from seemingly out of nowhere, two cops come running at the cars with their guns drawn. The cops were screaming, Mother sucker, let me see your hands! Don't move, you frick! All kinds of deliciously profane things to shout in the middle of the day in the middle of a city. They slapped the hood of the first car and yelled at the driver to take off, and then stood on opposite sides of the rear car, their guns aimed through the windows and still screaming. A few moments later, about ten cop cars pull up, lights and sirens, and cops start piling out with their guns drawn. A couple with shotguns that they racked and then leveled at the car. I was about 20 feet away, but none of them seemed to even notice. I wasn't told to back away or anything. As this is happening, a small crowd began to gather. So since I'm on the passenger side, I can't see the driver. The cops open the door on my side and pull out the passenger. He was a normal-looking guy, white guy in t-shirt and jeans, and they lay him down on the road, cuff him, and take him off to the squad car. So far, pretty interesting. Then, they take the driver out and lay him on the ground, but since he's on the other side of the car, I still can't see him. Cops then start pulling things out of the car and putting them on the hood. Bottle of pills, a backpack, and then a gun. This is getting more interesting. Then, as we're all watching in rapt attention, this huge cop, black, probably 6 foot 5 and about 300 pounds, reaches down to pick up the driver. He does so with one hand and we all stand in amazement as we realize the driver is a midget and is dangling from the hands of this gigantic cop. The midget is screaming at the top of his lungs, Frick you cops, blah, blah, blah. And the cop pretty much carries him one-handed to a squad car and throws him in the back. When the cruiser takes off, there was a moment of silence. And then everyone, probably 30 bystanders, a dozen cops, Everyone starts laughing hysterically at the same time. I called every single person I knew just so that I would not be accused of making it up. It was hands down the funniest thing I've seen. So many of these stories start when a person goes outside for a cigarette. I need to start smoking. Story 15. My mom took me to get my hair cut at a salon when I was a 13-year-old boy. I usually get my hair cut at the barber, but we didn't have the time. So this petite gay guy is talking nice and cutting my hair. Next to me is this 14-year-old chick looking kind of cute. She has two huge gay guys cutting her hair. I'm six foot two, 240 pounds, and I was about that size when I was 13. These two guys were lisping and snipping at her long blonde hair with their tight black shirts and huge arms. Ten minutes into her haircut, the guys cutting her hair start barking at each other that the other was cutting her hair wrong. These two huge gay guys start throwing fists and connecting on each other's face. One stabs the other with a scissor in the arm. Blood is everywhere. The petite gay guy cutting my hair gets between me and the brawl, gets some blood on him, and gets hit in the face. The fight gets broken up, the one guy goes to the hospital, and my haircut was free of charge. That was way more exciting than the barber. You know, I'll be honest, I'd go back to that place. I'd make that my regular spot. Talking and meeting new people is great. I'm sure the barber was nice. But sometimes you want a little action mixed up in your day. You know what I mean? I'd go back just to see the aftermath. Story 16. I used to do security and landed a gig at the Teen Choice Awards. I landed the very best position that night. 
guarding some high-powered confetti blowers right next to the stage. I was underneath the section of the stage that rose up and the announcer stood. I saw every star from just a few feet away from them. Some older dude sitting near me kept turning around and later told me, Most of the girls here aren't wearing panties. I wasn't wearing my glasses, so it was pointless for me to stare out into the crowd. I hear them announce Megan Fox coming up to present the next award and look upwards as she walks into position. She wasn't wearing panties. I never do. Story 17. I am female. Another female friend and I went to pick up a guy we worked with to go play pool. When we got there, he came out with another guy who he introduced as his friend Jack. Jack needed to stop at someone's house really quickly to pick something up. Sure, no problem. I didn't think anything of it. So we stop on the way in a neighborhood and I pull into a random driveway and we wait while Jack runs up to the front door of the house. Someone lets him in and a few minutes pass by. We sit there with the radio on making small talk. All of a sudden, Jack comes flying out of the house, hops back into my car and yells, Floor it! Before I can even think twice, I see a big guy come running out of the house towards my car. I immediately throw the car in reverse, back down the driveway and onto the road. As soon as I put the car in drive and press the gas, big guy jumps on my hood and is glaring at me from a foot away through the windshield. He's screaming to stop the car, grabs and breaks off my wiper and slides off the car. I gun it, tearing down the street, yelling at Jack, What the hell? Big guy is chasing the car for two blocks until we lose him completely. It turns out our guy friend was unaware of what Jack had planned and didn't really know him that well to begin with. Jack had stolen a rather large amount of powdered nervous energy from his dealer and put our lives in danger to pull it off. Never in my life had I ever been in shady situations like that before, and all of a sudden I was the driver of a getaway car. I've never been so scared in my life. Jack didn't seem to give a care about any of it, and seemed apathetic when we dropped him off at a gas station and sped off. Our guy friend cut ties with him soon after. Story 18. I know this will probably get sent to the bottom and one person will read it, but what the heck. When I was in Iraq, we were on patrol in this city in the northernish part of Iraq. We were ordered to get out and go on foot to secure some buildings. I got caught up talking to our sergeant. I'm not sure how much time went by, but out of nowhere, I hear this terrific blast. Someone had tripped an IED device, or it was remotely detonated. I turned around and see bodies flying all around. Everything seemed like it went in slow motion. If you can remember in Saving Private Ryan when Tom Hanks storms the beach and his ears are ringing and he can't hear anything, that's what it felt like. Four of my fellow Marines were lying on the ground crying in pain. Yes, Marines cry. One guy had his leg blown off. So much blood. So much screaming and yelling. I saw so much awful stuff over there. I never even told my parents or friends about this story. It sickens me. I've never served, so I have no frame of reference for this. As far as comparing things to Saving Private Ryan, I was told that at the first scenes on the storming of Normandy Beach, people who were actually at Normandy Beach had to step out of the theater because the sound was just so realistic to what they had gone through. To be fair, the thing that got me on that scene was the bullets whizzing by. The sound design and the positioning on that were just incredible. It made me feel like they were actually zipping by me. Story 19. OSU Michigan football game in Columbus 2005-2006, I forget. After the Bucks won, I stepped onto the porch with a few friends to have a smoke. As soon as I get outside, it smells like smoke. Sure enough, there's a seven-foot-high stack of porch furniture on fire right in front of the house I was at in the middle of the road. The fire really begins to grow as dozens of people are continuing to toss more and more couches and chairs onto this inferno. Now, keep in mind, all of this takes place in a little under one minute. Out of nowhere, a city snowplow comes flying out of the alleyway and crushes the whole pile down to nothing and scatters it all over the road and alley. Cheers erupt from all the neighboring houses at the scene, loving the hysteria that's going on around them. All of a sudden, a huge beam of light shines down right onto the street, followed by another as two police helicopters swoop across the area. Then, almost immediately after all this stuff is going down, a wall of police on horseback arrive. 
I mean, these police own the street sidewalk to sidewalk, batons in hand, just swatting at anyone stupid enough to get in their way. They marched right down the street and dispersed the area in less than one minute. No one was injured. Best thing I've ever seen. Dispersed is an awesome misspelling. Story 20. You know how sometimes when you see or hear someone committing an act of douchebaggery, your immediate reaction is wishing they get exactly what's coming to them? Well, one night I was sitting on a bench outside a train station, and I can hear this guy driving like a real jerkwad. I can't see him yet, but I can tell from the sounds that he's doing burnouts and donuts and the like on the public street next to the building. I say to myself, I hope that butthole wrecks his car. And as soon as I get out the word car, I look up and see him coming screaming around the side of the building and slam his car head on into a telephone pole. It wasn't particularly crazy by conventional standards, but the timing of it was just insane. Story 21. I've seen a camel get so angry that it threw up its own stomach. A close second is the time I was cave diving and I came around a corner only to end up face to face with a shark. It was just hanging out and we scared the hell out of each other. A third was the time we came upon a pod of dolphins that took shelter from a recent storm in a cove. There were about 60 of them. I put on my fins and swam with the dolphins as long as they let me. I knew I had to stop when one of the larger males very suddenly darted towards me and blocked my path. Well, that's the gamut of the Animal Kingdom instances right there. Most people pay to swim with the dolphins. This guy got to do it for free. That's cool. Spooking a shark and not getting attacked by it is pretty cool, too. Is it normal for camels to get so angry they throw up their own stomach? Is that a thing? I gotta look that up afterwards. Story 22. Disclaimer. I live in an old farmhouse, so I was lying on my couch surfing the internet on my laptop when something tickled the right side of my neck. I batted it away thinking it was just a fly, but I saw something sort of move away out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look and saw nothing unusual. I went back to perusing the internet for a moment, paused, then looked over my other shoulder. Trailing out from under the pillow my head was on was the scaly body of a fairly large snake. In an instant, I realized that the snake was under the pillow. The tickle on my neck had been the snake tasting me. Much leaping about and screaming ensued. Sure enough, it was a five-foot-long black snake, which at least is harmless. It was wrapped around my head, in my living room, on my couch, What freaked me out the most was that I never even heard it moving, never even felt it sneaking under my pillow. It was days before I could sit on that couch again. I kept seeing that snake under my pillow. Story 23. Our pet turkey, who we kept on the roof of our apartment complex that was in Mexico, pooped all over a Jehovah's Witness that came knocking on our door. Story 24. I had an apartment in downtown Denver that had a spectacular view of a bunch of crazy stuff. It was the third floor on a corner of a three-lane one-way. There were wrecks on a weekly basis, and we just got used to keeping binoculars handy as soon as we heard tires screeching. There was a lot of paid spicy activity, substances, muggings. In the two years I lived there, I got attacked twice. We also kept a bunch of weapons by the front door, just in case. The wall of death included nunchucks, police clubs, and a golf club left behind when a guy got caught trying to steal my car. So one time I hear a lot of yelling coming from the street. Get on the friggin' ground right now! I'm giving you to the count of three! At least eight cop cars have converged on a bunch of gang members from both sides of the streets. There was about a dozen black guys in the center of the street and cops blocking all exits with their guns drawn. They must have tailed these guys until the right moment. One side of the street had tall buildings and the other a school with a tall fence, so they were stuck. There was yelling, most of the gang had their hands up and looked like they were giving up. Then, one of them ran, a fat, slow-moving one, too. This was the mid-90s, so I don't think tasers were common then. A bunch of SWAT-type cops tackled him and beat the hell out of him. They were wailing on him with sticks from all sides. Several of the SWAT guys stayed on him after that. I could see his head lifting up off the ground a few times with the binoculars, so I knew he was alive. His friends went right to the ground after that. I saw them all get cuffed and they stayed on the ground. The officers would go one at a time and search them. 
Everything got put into baggies in the hood and trunk of a car. The street was blocked off for almost two hours. The one that ran away was hauled away in an ambulance. The rest were taken away individually in police cars. You want to know when something really big has gone down? The police keep high-fiving each other during the bust. Yeah, this was the 90s. This is around the time of Rodney King and when videotaping became the thing. Whatever side of the story you might be on here, you realize that that's the point where things started to change as far as the view of law enforcement. I can't speak to whether this was a real bust or not. I don't know whether this was an actual bust or whether it was over-the-top police brutality. Maybe there was a mixture mixed in. But it sounds like this was the point where things started to change. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.